good morning and uh, welcome to our keynote interview session lessons from the emergence of coronaviruses over two decades. I'm delighted to, to present our interviewee, uh, Professor David Heyman. Uh, I'll briefly introduce David, uh, who is a professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a distinguished fellow of the Center of Universal Health at Chatham House and the former chairman of Public Health England. Uh, David worked for several decades with WHO in Geneva and developing countries and was really involved uh, in executive roles in, in many uh, communicable disease control efforts uh, globally and he's a, a world-renowned expert uh, in the field. And uh, David, thank you so much for being with us uh, today at this uh, unusual conference uh, <laughs> on COVID-19. Um, so I will start off by, by asking you to uh, reflect on really the last two decades of global, global uh, pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, what did previous emerging infections, uh, in particular coronavirus outbreaks, teach us that shapes up uh, our current response to COVID-19? Well, thanks, Jacob, and thanks for that kind introduction. You know, if I were to say one thing about um, emerging infections over the past 20 years, it would be that the animal-human interface is very important. And we need to better understand how infections emerge. We know they emerge at a random, um, as a random event. And oftentimes there are many risk factors that line up to cause those emerging um, events to occur. Um, with coronaviruses, there's been a very interesting study about three years ago, which looks at the molecular clock tracing uh, the human coronavirus 043 back to a point in time where it might have been the same sequence as the bovine um, coronavirus from which it is thought to have come into humans. And if you look at that and trace backwards, you come to a period between 1850 and 1890, which is a period when there was a major outbreak called the Russian influenza outbreak, which may not have been influenza, in fact, which may have been the emergence of this coronavirus. So today we're living the emergence of a coronavirus, which may have had a precedent in this, and certainly the other three endemic coronaviruses in humans, there are a total of four, certainly they emerged at some point in time with the same fanfare as is occurring today, but in a world where transmission was less obvious and probably spread less rapidly around the world. So in other words, um, uh, it, it may well be that uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, is here to stay for a long time. Well, I think all indications are that now this will become an endemic disease as the four previous um, coronaviruses, as has HIV become endemic after its emergence, and tuberculosis and many other infections in humans. You know, these, these organisms don't come in on the tail of a comet. They're here. They're living in animals or in some other area in nature, and occasionally they breach that species barrier between humans and animals and cause an outbreak. Sometimes it's just a one infection like rabies, which causes a one-time infection. It may be a cluster of uh, infections like happens with Ebola and then re reinserts itself in nature, comes again at a future point in time, or they become endemic such as HIV and such as we believe uh, this coronavirus might be doing at present. So we experienced uh, two major uh, coronavirus uh, emergences uh, over the last two decades with uh, SARS uh, almost 20 years ago and then MERS. Uh, but still, these were quite different incidents uh, with respect to epidemiology. Uh, but did we learn something from, from, those, uh, from those incidents that helped us in, in our current response? Yeah, well, well, thank Jacob. I think what's most, what was most impressive to me about the SARS emergence was the fact that the world really worked closely together to make sure that this didn't become endemic if it was so destined. 
it was a different virus clearly than the coronavirus today. It was a coronavirus that reproduced lower in the respiratory tract and needed to really have a deep cough or, or some type of a procedure which aerosolized it and then spread it to others. But uh, there was a global effort to really identify this rapidly and come together to stop it by listening to certain recommendations from WHO. And there was a very strong director general at that time, a former prime minister, and in addition, a pediatrician who was not afraid to really tell the world, you must watch out for this. You must decrease your travel to certain areas. You must do various things, including um, working with China to make sure that they reported and became a part of the response instead of having built a firewall between the response and China. So it, it was a very successful um, and undertaking and that virus did not become endemic. Maybe it was not destined to become endemic, but it didn't become endemic, it disappeared. MERS coronavirus, as you know, Jacob, is entirely different. It's a virus that's carried in the nasal passage of camels and that virus periodically infects humans. But this virus, the, the MERS coronavirus, doesn't transmit very easily from human to human, face to face, as did SARS, as does the current coronavirus. But it does transmit in hospital settings where there's a lapse in infection prevention and control, as we've seen in Saudi Arabia and as we saw in a major outbreak in South Korea. So these viruses have all been different. They all have different characteristics. The one today, though, the coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus too, appears to be one that's fairly easily spread from person to person and may in fact become endemic over time. So for many years, we were discussing this uh, disease X, right? Uh, this uh, agent that could uh, really uh, uh, pose a significant global health uh, threat. And, and I wonder uh, if, if COVID-19, I mean, with respect to mortality rate, obviously this is not uh, the, the, the agent X that we were uh, thinking of uh, because the mortality rate is, is lower. But on the other hand, its transmissibility uh, is such that it is a major threat. So do you think we're still expecting the worst or is, is the worst here already? Well, you know, uh, Jacob, I think at the start of this, when the modelers used influenza as a potential model for this infection, it was misleading in certain ways. And so now it's clearly understood that this virus causes outbreaks, discrete outbreaks that can be stopped. And if those outbreaks are traced retrospectively back to a source, many times that source can be eliminated. If it's a nightclub, for example, it can be either closed down or people can learn that this is an area where they must take special precautions. And tracing forward identifies contacts, isolates them, and decreases transmission into communities. It's not like influenza that just comes in waves and immediately spreads into communities and uh, is not really controllable. So outbreaks can be stopped with this. And that's been a key to the response in many Asian countries that have had successful responses. In Germany, in many countries, I'm sure in Israel as well, there's been outbreak response that wasn't stopped during the phase of lockdown, but continued and helped decrease that community transmission. Now countries are faced with exiting from lockdown. Many of them didn't have any particular strategy or some are just continuing to suppress the virus, hoping that in the future, there will be a vaccine that they can use that will add to their armamentarium of what to do. But I think what we need to do today is learn to live with the virus using the tools we have, including the diagnostic tests, which permit us to see where infection is occurring, where it has occurred, and helps us to isolate people to prevent these massive surgence, insurgence of virus, but rather a slower um, um, establishment of what might be endemicity. Okay. Um, now, if we're looking at uh, reports or planning or policy documents uh, for pandemic preparedness over the years, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on how to prepare the healthcare system, how to uh, devise uh, treatment and, and prevention uh, strategies. But my impression, and I'm happy to hear yours, uh, is that the broader societal and economical impact is, is uh, not so well uh, 
uh, covered. And uh, I wonder if COVID-19 took us by surprise in, in this sense. Uh, did we underestimate the magnitude of effect that this virus would have on the economy, uh, our daily lives, and how uh, governments will, will respond to it? And uh, the, the tensions between the health and, and economy that underpin uh, decision making. Yeah, Jacob, it's been it's been very difficult for countries to deal with this virus. Um, Asian countries, on one hand, um, treated it as they had dealt with MERS and SARS previously. They knew that they could stop outbreaks with good rigorous contact tracing. They knew that they could do other activities which would permit them to control the virus. Countries in many other parts of the world just used the blunt tool of lockdown following the example that China had set without really taking into consideration that maybe there was an epidemiological approach they could be using instead. You know, I think uh, um, Singapore, for example, showed the way with what they call circuit breakers, where they saw that there was transmission occurring. They immediately did something to stop that transmission in those areas, whether it was a school or a nightclub. And then they opened up again with good monitoring. Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan have done the same. Hong Kong, they've done the same. And Vietnam has also uh, been able to keep this virus at a low level of transmission. Um, when countries lock down in Europe and in some parts of the Americas, they lock down without really any exit strategy at the start, just trying to protect hospitals and health systems and to decrease mortality, which is very important. They succeeded in doing that with these blunt tools. And now many countries are struggling to see what's next. Whereas Asia continues in its a steadfast way of dealing with outbreaks and epidemiological approach as has done Germany and many uh, countries in Europe as well. But some countries just choose this blunt tool and now they're thinking about what do we do next in order to keep transmission suppressed while we may be waiting for a vaccine or a therapeutic which may or may not come. Okay, so, so picking up on this uh, and, and maybe uh, emphasizing the, the point about the economy, um, you hear in many countries people saying that uh, uh, the economical crisis that uh, will or is already uh, happening uh, due to uh, COVID-19 could have uh, an even more significant death toll uh, and impact on, on public health than the virus itself. And uh, so many people advocate, uh, you know, more liberal approaches, uh, and not locking down because of the uh, economical toll. So what is your view about this? Well, my initial reaction was that what these lockdowns will do when they were generalized, they would increase the difference between those who have resources and those who don't. It would increase the inequalities in countries. And I think that's not yet clearly been shown up because thankfully governments were able to provide uh, support to people who needed it and they've been very generous in doing that but the jury still remains as to what the long-term effect of these um, so-called lockdowns will be and I think everybody's concerned that the inequalities will have increased and that it will be very difficult for certain segments of the population to find work to continue on a recovery phase um, moving forward. So, you know, I think a lot of that's to be seen, but I think the countries that have tried to do an epidemiological approach, not generalized blunt tool locking down, but locking down where they saw transmission occurring, may have in the long run um, been better off in, in, in trying to um, avoid an increase in disparity and inequalities. And then of course, there's the model in Sweden which um, has let the virus enter, but has counted on its populations to do the job, which is very important. Populations are at the base of any response going forward in any country, and they must understand how to protect each other and protect themselves. And that includes wearing masks if they can't physically distance in areas such as shops or in, in, in the underground. And, uh, yes, and, and perhaps also uh, there are more longer term repercussions like mental health uh, aspects to, uh, to the pandemic and, and uh, other health issues. I mean, 
Are we going to see uh, surges in, in cancer, for example, in five years because of uh, uh, reduced uh, primary prevention and screening that is not taking place at the moment? Yeah, I think those are things that we need to be watching so that we can better deal with the next pandemic uh, when it or should it occur. So yes, I think we need to be watching all of those things because we may be seeing that, that the, um, the effects of, on mortality from this in the long term may have been greater than the mortality from the infection itself. You know, when you look at this infection worldwide, there are close to a million deaths, which is a million too many deaths, clearly. But if you put that on a population of 7.2 or 7.3 billion in the world, it's not specific, it's not especially um, elevated. It's as elevated as other mortality from other infectious diseases. It might be on the level of malaria or, or a, a little bit less than TB and other infections. But you know, we have to take all of this into consideration moving forward. And clearly no one will be able to understand what the long-term impact has been until that long-term, those next five years or so have passed. But we are beginning to see that there is an excess mortality in some sectors and some types of disease, whereas there's a decreased mortality in others. During lockdown in many countries, there was a decrease in mortality from automobile accidents. So, you know, the, the knock-on effects will not be understood until the economists can get a hold of this and really take a close look at what has gone on and what might be um, in store in the future. Hopefully that won't be too dire. Right, so, so you mentioned uh, uh, health inequalities and uh, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I mean, we, we hear a lot about the difficulties countries are facing, but the ground situation in uh, in low-income countries may uh, be even worse, uh, especially with uh, the health disparities and the poor uh, infrastructure. And uh, you have a lot of experience also working in, in such uh, countries as an epidemiologist. And so maybe you could comment on how you see the current situation uh, in the developing world and uh, what should be the necessary short and long-term steps that we need. Well, you know, in, in general, a caveat before all of that is the fact that we don't know the long-term effects of infection with this virus. Clearly, this virus has been studied and its effects studied great more, more than most other viral infections. And we know that there are some long-term disabilities or some mental illnesses that might have come from the lockdown. There are a whole series of things related to the virus. Um, how that will play out in developing countries is not clear. In Africa, as we've seen, mortality has remained, at least reported mortality, has remained relatively low compared to other infections in Africa. And at the same time, it appears that there's been less of a surge of patients in hospitals. Is this because there's already immunity to coronaviruses in Africa that's across immunity? And this is protecting those populations, those populations that are disparate, that have less than in industrialized countries? Or is it some other reason? We really don't know what's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in other countries, uh, it may be that in areas where there's been extremely high transmission, especially in areas where there are those people who are living who are poor, they may have already been infected. And that infection may have given some type of immunity that will protect for a short period of time or a longer period of time from reinfection, or they may also protect from serious illness in the future. All of these things will come out and play out, but in those countries where there are greater inequalities or where there are um, less privileged populations than in some of the industrialized countries, it may be that they will be better off in the long term because they've already been exposed to this virus um, and it's been a virus which hasn't caused serious illness in, in some of those people. We just have to see the caveat being, again, we don't know the long-term outcomes of infection. We hope they won't be serious. Back to you, Jacob. Okay, maybe we can mention the vaccines, which uh, is, a, is a great hope. Uh, everyone is now looking forward to the uh, results of uh, several big uh, clinical trials. So there are obviously uh, massive efforts for vaccine development and maybe unprecedented also with respect to the uh, 
uh, amount of resource that is being uh, invested in vaccine development and also the, uh, the expedited development, which is really impressive. Um, so what is your estimation uh, with respect to uh, maybe the coming year? I, I know it's very difficult to, uh, to predict, but, but still, uh, how is the coming year uh, going to look like with respect to our uh, vaccination uh, landscape? Well, you've, you've touched on one of the most important points is the unprecedented um, work in trying to develop a vaccine. And hopefully there will be a vaccine. But you know, there are many unknowns and many things that are becoming known now. For example, we know that in some people who had infection, verified infection three or four months ago, they have been reinfected with a different virus. So will a vaccine be able to overcome that problem and prevent reinfection? At the same time, will a vaccine be able to create some type of immunity which will decrease the seriousness of infection should it occur. We, we just don't know a lot about what will happen um, with a vaccine because we don't understand the immune response. Although the, the efforts to understand it in animal models are quite unprecedented, as are the efforts in humans. So I think all we can say is that we can hope for a vaccine. We don't know whether that vaccine will give long-lasting or short-lived protection, what type of boosters might be required. But I think, again, Jacob, it's not useful to say we'll suppress the virus until there's a vaccine. We need to use those tools we have today to make sure that we deal with this virus as best we can. And I just go back to an example in history where it, it talks about using the tools we have today to the best advantage. And that was back in smallpox eradication. Smallpox was eradicated with a virus which was with a vaccine which did cause um, one death per million vaccinees. It was not a safe vaccine as we would see a vaccine today. Yet it was used and smallpox was declared eradicated in 1980. In 1981, a new virus, HIV, was first identified. And in 1985, a military recruit in the U.S. was vaccinated for against smallpox, developed generalized vaccinia, and six months later had AIDS because he was HIV infected. And we know today that that vaccine could not be used safely in HIV infected persons. So we took advantage of a window of opportunity using those tools we had available to get rid of a disease which is now eradicated. That's a, a, an example of how effective a vaccine can be, but we do have tools today, especially diagnostic tests that we can use that can help us with an epidemiological approach to controlling the entry of this vaccine, this virus, into countries while we're waiting for a vaccine. So we need to use those tools to the maximum advantage today and make sure that they, they are used and that they are used effectively. So just an example of why it's important to use what we have today, not waiting for the future, because we don't know when that window of opportunity may close as it did for smallpox eradication. And uh... Assuming that we will have an effective uh, vaccine, fingers crossed. Um, what, what, what are, in your opinion, uh, the challenges for uh, global availability and delivery of uh, vaccines? We, we know that you mentioned uh, uh, smallpox, and we also know from the polio eradication efforts that it's uh, quite difficult to achieve uh, uh, good coverage in some parts of the world. Um, and also, uh, we may have some uh, shortages in, in vaccines, uh, at least uh, at the beginning. So how should we prioritize uh, vaccination efforts? Well, I think that the ACT Accelerator, which has as a part of it the COVAX initiative, is very important because they're beginning to talk about how there can be equitable distribution of vaccine and where that vaccine might be useful. And the ACT Accelerator is a very important tool moving forward. It, it's comprised, uh, it's being led by Gavi, by CEPI, and by other groups. And it's, it's really very important to make sure that that accelerator is used and the COVAX initiative is used to the maximum to make sure that we do um, have vaccine with equitable distribution. As you've said, we've seen equitable distribution in smallpox eradication. 
We've seen it in, in other areas. We've seen it in polio eradication. And we are seeing it in influenza because of the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, which was developed um, about 10 years ago. So there's hope that we can see more equitable distribution of vaccine. And hopefully the countries that have pre-purchased vaccine have not made it such that it will not be possible for others in the world to get that vaccine. And that's why the ACT Accelerator is so important. Um, I would like to touch on, on uh, another point, uh, which is uh, fake news and uh, uh, scientific communication in, in the pandemic. Um, I mean, uh, pandemic preparedness has always been uh, dominated by public health experts and, uh, and, and medical professionals. And the current crisis is really confusing especially for members of the public, but perhaps also for decision makers, uh, because it brings up questions like who is an expert and what is the scientific evidence and, and how information and data are being uh, disseminated and, and communicated. And uh, my question is, uh, what should we do in order to, to maintain a trustable scientific voice? And, and what lessons should we learn from COVID-19 for the future on, on how to communicate public health? Well, Jacob, I think the onus is on both the public health community and the politicians. The public health community has a long-term view. They're working in, in positions where they've been working long, they have great experience, and their voice must be heard. Politicians, on the other hand, have a shorter vision because they have a shorter term in office and they're looking at the next possibility. And in countries where the politicians and the public health leaders have been able to work together, the response has been much more unified and much more effective than in countries where there hasn't been that. And I'm thinking of my own country, the United States, and also of a country in which I worked in, in, in the United Kingdom. In both of those countries, the political voice has many times been more uh, vocal than has the public health voice. And I learned very early in my career from CDC in Atlanta that every outbreak requires a trusted face. It requires someone who the public can trust, can listen to, and can understand. And it's been very confusing in many countries to find that public health face. In Germany, there's been a clear face, Lothar Weiler and the Robert Koch Institute, a very clear face from the start of the outbreak. In the United States, there's been Tony Fauci, who's an immunologist, but the CDC has been silent and there's been no public face from CDC. And in the same way in the United Kingdom, it's the chief medical officer who's been speaking part-time and then political leaders part-time. But there really needs to be a trusted face that's available at all times to the public to understand and to look to, to get guidance as to what needs to be done next. And that guidance is very important because at the bottom of this, it's whether or not people can do their own risk assessment and respond in appropriate manner that will deal, that will make the outcome of this pandemic um, clear. If people understand how to assess their own risk, how to protect themselves, how to protect others, the problem will be solved. And hopefully Sweden has tried to do that and hopefully they will see that that's been effective in the long term. Okay, so as we will need to wrap up soon, uh, my, my uh, last question, which uh, I appreciate if you can briefly uh, answer. I mean, we have many researchers uh, also in the audience. And could you share your thoughts on what should be uh, the research priorities at the moment, where, where our scientists should invest their efforts? Well, I think the scientists have invested pretty well in moving forward. And I think what's really important now is to establish those cohorts of people who have had mild infection or serious illness and to follow them through to look and see what the long-term consequences may be. At the same time, it's important for the research to continue in therapeutics in, and also in, in vaccines. And countries have really responded to this well. In the UK, for example, they set up a rapid response panel which was providing resources, um, billions of pounds, to research that could be completed within a 12 month period to better understand just those issues, such as what are the long-term effects? 
what are some of the issues that we need to deal with today. And the way that countries have stepped up to provide resources for research is quite important. So I think that moving ahead, um, research has to continue in all these different areas. And in addition, in understanding how to better engage communities from the start so that they can deal with the pandemic in the way that they need to, because really at the heart of all this is understanding by local communities how they can contribute effectively to stopping further spread or to decreasing the uh, frequency of spread within their communities. David, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure speaking to you and uh, thank you for sharing your, uh, your thoughts and experience with us. And uh, just to mention that there is also a fireplace session that uh, you will be present. So uh, everyone is uh, also invited. So thank you so much, and I hope to be able to meet you soon uh, also in, in a physical conference and not uh, online. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jacob.